All right, well, it's good to have you here to study the Word of God. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 7 for our scripture reading today. Matthew chapter 7. We'll be reading verses 7 through 14. And let's uh, stand in the honor of reading of God's holy word. I like uh, one pastor, they said, well, why do you stand? Is that part of the sit down, you know, stand up, sit down, fight, 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 and a lot of ceremonial churches? No, it's because we want to distinguish between perfect, holy, inspired words and then uh, my human words, which hopefully are best ex- explain it, but are not um, anywhere near the same category. So let's uh, read Matthew 7. Please listen to God's holy word, verses 7 through 14. Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Or what man is there among you who his son asks for a loaf will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, he will not give him a snake, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more Will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? In everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you. For this is the law and the prophets. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. (coughs) But the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. And there are only a few who find it. May God bless the reading of his holy word. As we uh, pull up the sermon slides, and I want to again thank Dennis and Calvin for uh, just uh, filling in, giving me a breather, and it really was a blessing, guys. I really appreciate you, and thank you for being my, my closest friends. Um, the, the word, uh, especially last week, the Lord ministered to me. And my takeaway from last week was, uh, Chad, uh, I think you are trying to sanctify yourself at times out of human effort. And uh, that's why, you know, sometimes we fail miserably because if we try in our own strength, it says, without him, we are nothing. And that's why it says, if anyone speaks, he should speak as one speaking the very oracles or utterances of God. If anyone serves, let him speak with the, with the, says, with the strength, or let him serve with the strength that God provides. And so I want to just thank, uh, thank you, Dennis, for helping me, seeing that I was trying to sanctify myself out of a human effort rather than relying on the Holy Spirit in prayer or really letting the Word of God dwell in me richly. Uh, on an encouraging note, uh, some of you know that I struggle with idealism, and so instead of trying to plan out my perfect life like I, ever, I, I try to do every uh, New Year's resolution, anybody ever do that? You sit there and you're like, I'm going to have the perfect life this year. I'm going to do everything, for, I'm going to wake up at 6, I'm never going to go to bed late, I'm never going to do anything sinful, and I'm going to have my quiet time 365 days this year, and it's just going to be great. And then, of course, you have the reality check that lasts about two or three days, like until you go back to school or, you know, you have something going on. So anyway, this year, I know it's crazy that old doc can learn new tricks, but I said, I'm just going to focus on one thing. And so here's what I decided. I said, I'm going to, uh, instead of failing so quickly in my plans and trying to change myself, I'm going to allow, hopefully allow the Lord to change me. I'm going to do one thing, and that's I'm going to try to keep the main thing the main thing. Who knows what the main thing is? What's the main thing? And probably as far as your disciplined life, getting in the Word. Anybody know that that is the greatest thing Satan, he'll, I mean, it's just amazing the different ways, whether keep you late at night, get night, have a good day of rest, not feeling well, something comes up in the morning, or you just don't feel like, or whatever it is, how many of you know he will keep you out of the Word and prayer no matter what it takes? How many of you know this? Okay. So the one thing I'm like, I can't allow that to happen because when I'm out of the Word, I'm weak. My perspective is bad, my power is, is nowhere to be found, and, and I, I lack then that peace. So I always tell you, you need to get in the Word for three Bs. Perspective, power, and peace. Anybody need those? All right, so I said, I'm going to get the main thing going again, and I'm going to give him the first fruits of my day, that first, the best of, you know, that six to eight o'clock for me in the morning, and I'm going to have my power time. And so some of you know that uh, it's an acronym, and I would just challenge you that if you have one thing you're working on this year, let it not be faith getting out of the Word. What does power time mean to me? It means I want to pray and pour out my heart out to God. I want to then organize my day, plan my day according to the eternal things of what really lasts, God's will. I want to get in the Word and saturate my mind and heart with truth so that as I think, so also I live. 
Then I need some physical exercise, and of course you can see I, I get the pow, but I haven't I got the er yet, so just look at me, right? But I'm going to work on the er this year, all right? So I got the pow, I'm working on the er, um, but the exercise, the physical health to maintain, exercise, good diet, sleep. Some of you need those three things, we need to go back to that, because you need this temple operating at, at top performance, peak uh, performance, to serve the Lord as, mo as most effectively as you can be, and to give the best service to the king. And then R, we want to review and recite verses and hide God's word in our hearts so that we might not sin against him. And so I would really urge you, as far as uh, just that power time, to, to do that uh, this year as, as best you can. All right, so uh, there we go. Um, so I'm happy to report I, I didn't miss a day in January. I had a quiet time every day, power time every time, a day in January so far. And it's really helping my perspective and just saying, you know what, I... So, certain things happen, and I don't worry as much, or I don't react as much. And now it doesn't mean that uh, everything's perfect in my life, but I want to grow this year in Christian maturity. And I hope that's your goal as, as well, to nail down. Brad oftentimes told me when he discipled me as a younger man, he said, if you just nail down the one thing, nail down being consistent in the Word and constant prayer. So is your time in the Word negotiable or non-negotiable? What should it be? It should be a non-negotiable time. Everything else can happen in my day from 8 o'clock to, to whenever I go to bed. But I should say usually there's not a whole lot between 6 and 8 that takes me down unless, here's the key, I let it. So I would ask you, what's the one thing that you can do? And one thing that's also helped me is I uh, appreciate uh, Calvin uh, <coughs> and Dennis uh, uh, two years ago gave me an iPad and I figured out how to finally use it, technology. Uh, challenge here, but I've just been, uh, there's a little keyboard I got, and just helpful, I can take it real with me anywhere I go, and I can just type out, and I'm actually recording my thoughts and what God's teaching me, and I can see for the last 30 days, well, okay, I'm going through the book of Mark, and I'm just writing down a little commentary to myself in an application, and it's helpful then for me to see, okay, well, I, I haven't missed, and that's good, you know, just to kind of see, here's what God has, has done in my life, this is the grace of God in my life, and Maybe you get a quiet time journal or you, you get that, that going just to see that progress. That's very encouraging. My brother, uh, my late brother Drew, uh, before he died in that accident, he would always call his quiet time AWG. Hey, I've got to get my AWG in today. And I'm like, what's AWG? And he's like, appointment with God. Because he's like, when I was an officer in the Army or when he worked for Merrill Lynch, he says, if I ever had a, my, my boss say, I want you in my office at 7 a.m. tomorrow morning, he says, I would not dare miss it. He's like, why then would I ever then miss out on the God of the universe calling me to spend time with him each and every day? So whether you need power or you need an AWG, I encourage you to fill, get that power, that peace, <coughs> and that perspective. As 2 Peter 1, 5 through 8 says, For this reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, <coughs> to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, it will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of the Lord. So how many of you admit you had some ineffective, unproductive times last year in 2013? And you want to change that. This is the key. And so that's uh, not what the sermon's on. That's just uh, what it's about today. Let's see. Oh, there we go. Let's then look at a couple goals we wanted, I want to re-vector us. This is the first time I'm in the pulpit, actually, in 2014. Uh, let's see, hopefully we can get this to work. John, can you, uh, there we go. Let me just remind you some of our goals as a church, and I think what makes us unique. First of all, we want to be a church that loves the Word. Uh, my Greek professor says something to me profound. He said, you know, Chad, a, a, the difference between a good teacher and a great teacher, says, do you know what the difference is? And I said, no. He says, a good teacher gets you, uh, teaches you the information and so you're proficient so you can pass the test. A great teacher inspires a love of the subject. That was good. Because I thought, you know what? A great teacher is not someone who just says, oh, you can pass the test, you, you know, you can perform a surgery, or whatever it is, as a doctor, or anything like that. But it says, do you love the Lord Jesus? And I would say to you, we want to love the Word here at Truth Bible Church. Read it, study, memorize it, treasure it in your heart. And if you ever want to see someone who loved and treasured the Word, you need to read Psalm 119. Right? All 170-some verses. But he says, I, this one in, in verse 11, Your word have I treasured in my heart that I might not sin against you. When we want to do that this year. Two, this year in 2014, I want to know the word better. I want to be able to navigate it. 
and I want to be instructed by it. I want to grow in it, as Paul said to Timothy, let your progress be evident to all. I want you to look at your pastor and say, hey, he's, he's got some, some irritating quirks and things, but he's at least moving from point A to point B. Slowly, but, but for, for you as well, and say, I want to progress from my point A spiritually to my point B. 2 Peter 3.18, to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But then I want you guys to understand, and I want to understand <coughs> the Word of God. Because, by the way, you can know the Word, but can you know it and memorize it, kind of like the uh, Islamic professors? They memorize all this, but do they understand anything that they're reading? Or those who are you know, Yale Divinity professors, they know, they, they know it, but they don't understand it <coughs> or they don't apply it. But I, we want to grasp the deep and profound truths of Scripture we want to ask to be filled with the knowledge of his will, as Paul prayed for the Colossians, with all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you will walk, how? In a manner worthy of the Lord, to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all power, according to his glorious might, for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience, joyously giving thanks to the Father, who is qualified to us to share in the inheritance of the saints and light. That's my prayer for us and for you this year. Lord, help us to grow in, 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 in wisdom and understanding so that we are walking, man, and pleasing you in every, or as later on it says, that you, you come to have first place in everything. Um, te- uh, we want to teach them the word. I want you to not only be able to know it and to love it and understand it. Here's part of that quality of, uh, of teaching is that we want it to teach you to then where you can teach others. Are, are, are you competent to lead someone to Christ and disciple them to maturity? Or are the statistics going to be true of truth vouchers that less than 5 of you, 5% of you ever lead someone to Christ, and then of that 5%, less than 1% ever disciple them to, to basic Christian maturity? Let not that be true of us, amen? We want to be different. We, I, want to, I want you to be able to take what I teach you and pass it. That's biblical, by the way. See the four generations of discipleship? Paul says, Paul discipled Timothy. Then he says, Timothy, find faithful men who then be able to disciple others also. Four generations of discipleship. That's our goal. We want to proclaim the word. We want to then take this, this word, this message, this, this evangelion, this, this gospel, good news, and proclaim it to the nations. To be ambassadors for Christ. As though God were making his appeal through us. To beg people, I beg of you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. And then finally, we want to live out the word where people see the difference of Christ in our lives. <laughs> if, if they don't see the difference in our marriages, in our businesses, in, in our joy, in our attitudes, in our speech, what, what good is this? And so we want to live it out. We want to practically obey his word, put it into practice. As James 1 says, don't prove yourself to be doers of the word and not hearers only and so delude yourself. We don't want to be the deluded church, Right? We want to be a conquering and overcoming church, setting a good example by the way we live. So that's uh, some of just the vision I, I would pray and ask you guys to help me. And so, so a, qu- a question for you in 2014. Are you a positive, joyful, and thankful person? Are you someone who encourages others and builds others up, <coughs> who they love to be around because of that? Or are you grumpy, self-focused, critical, someone who tears people down with your words? And I just want to say, I want to be that kind of person in 2014. I want to be a joyful person. And so I want, I want your desire to know him, to love him, serve him, worship. And yes, as I said before, enjoy him. As Philippians 3.8, listen to this, it says this. More than that, I count all things to be lost in, in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish, literally dung in Greek, okay, so that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. That is truly our desire. Well, that uh, then brings us back then to the chronological life of Christ. So yes, you're back. And we have been studying the Sermon on the Mount for uh, the whole summer. <coughs> we're, gonna, we're in chapter 7 <coughs> and going to be finishing that out here in the next couple weeks. If you're new with us, that, what that is is we're putting Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John together in one woven 
uh, narrative with the goal of living like our Lord Jesus, knowing his life and then living like him. And so where have we gone? We've, got, we've studied his preexistence there in John 1. We've studied his birth there in Luke and Matthew, his genealogy, his early childhood. He grew in wisdom and stature, things of God. We've then looked at his early Judean ministry, his baptism, <coughs> temptation in the wilderness. And now we're currently in his Galilean ministry, where we've camped out all summer on the Sermon on the Mount, one of the, the most important uh, messages of all time. What are the, the points of it? We want that we think that the critical part of this, the sermon is realizing it tells us how to get in the, the kingdom and how to be rewarded in the kingdom and that our righteousness falls short in entering that kingdom. So one thing I wanted to point out as we look then back in this uh, passage in Matthew 7 is that there's a lot of parallels between the Sermon on the Mount and the book of James. Why might there be parallels <coughs> in the book of James with uh, the Sermon on the Mount. Any, any, any ideas? James, wasn't James the, uh, the apostle, um, the, the part of the three? James, who wrote the book of James, was probably the half-brother of Jesus. And Matthew tells us <coughs> that he was, in, he was probably unbelieving until 1 Corinthians tells us that he, Jesus appeared to him in a post-resurrection appearance, and I think that changed everything. But does that mean that, that James wasn't there with Jesus when he was in Galilee, perhaps hearing his brother preach on the Sermon on the Mount? Pretty interesting thing of all the parallels how it talks about being joyful in trials, being complete, uh, trying to go towards maturity, looking at, uh, <coughs> at loving God in, in as far as trusting him with our, our things, uh, avoiding sinful anger, being doers of the word, having God's heart, and uh, just, just overall showing mercy and kindness, recognizing unbelievers by their fruits, etc. Where this is a parallel today is we see that it says, ask God with right motives in order to act th for you to receive what you need. One of the things when we, when we look at this is that when I look at asking with right motives, it says, ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door will be opened. That's the verse we're going to look at today and really seek to understand. What does that verse mean? Well, part of it is saying, do I have a right heart that even asked to begin with? Is this, should we ask about material things or is that what this is really about? We'll take a look at that here. And uh, so one of the things we see is that James says, what's the source of quarrels that have come among you? Is not the source of, of pleasures, uh, that w is not the source of, for your pleasures that, what, what, I can't read this, is not the source, your pleasures that wage war in your members. You lust and do not have, you murder and, and, and commit murder. You're envious and can't obtain so that you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not, what? Ask. So we see this parallel here in James. You ask and you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend it, what God gives you, on your pleasures. You adulterers, don't you know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? Whoever then wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you not think that Scripture says without person he jealously desires the spirit which he has made to dwell in us? But God gives us greater grace, therefore God is opposed to the proud, but his grace to the humble. So today I want to ask you, are you asking and how are you asking? Are you a fervent person in prayer, and are you asking for the right things, <coughs> and do you have the right attitude? <coughs> wow. So when we look at these parallels, we want to say, are we asking with right motives? James 1 also talks about us. If any of you lacks wisdom, what's the answer? He should ask God, and God will give generously to him without finding fault. But if any of you doubts, it says, that man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all he does. So this, these, these parallels is introducing us to our topic. We see that the Lord has what we need, and we need to ask him for what we need. But what is it that we really need? Is, is what Jesus is saying here, ask him for a million bucks, or ask him for your, your Justin Bieber Lamborghini that got impounded, you know? Uh, it's, I guess it's for sale now, I don't know. But... Okay, a little humor there, but, but is your greatest need your food or clothing shelter? Or is Jesus saying, ask for something else? I think you're, you're going to see today, we can ask God for anything, but the primary thing that we ask him for is salvation. And I think that is the context, because the context of Matthew 5 through 7 is a gospel presentation. It is Jesus' clearest gospel presentation. It's the most thorough gospel presentation and I believe it's the greatest gospel presentation ever given. So can, can we learn how to share the gospel by studying it? 
And, and Jesus, <coughs> you're saying, seek, knock, ask, and enter the kingdom. That is what is the context of these words. And so we're going to cover that this morning. Say, is, is this what I need? Our greatest need is not food, clothing, shelter. Yes, there is some of that mentioned in the context. But God knows and he cares about and he will provide for our physical needs. But more than that, we need life itself. The woman at the well, does she need water? Yes, she needed water. But what was her greatest need to ask Jesus for? The living water. So one of the results of the fall and the ensuing curse on mankind and sinners is that we have an enemy called death. We're all going to die. We're all sinners. And so our greatest need is having the cure for the solution of our sin and death problem. And that's what Jesus is giving here in this sermon. And in, this, and, and in that, he's saying, ask essentially for the kingdom of God. And you know what the answer is? He'll give it to you. Free of charge. Solely by grace. Basically he's saying, knock. Knock what? Knock where on what? The, the door of the kingdom. And he's talking about the, the great grace and blessing of being in the kingdom of going through that door, but also the great dread and horror of those who will be shut out. In those words, they were shut out and saying, hey, let us in. And I appreciate Jermaine watched a ranger for us while we were, we were gone. Well, that, that dog, he, on a cold night, you know, he'll let you know he wants in. But isn't it amazing that God has given us the grace to place us as children at the table and not, as Revelation says, outside are the dogs meaning the unbelievers, they are shut out on a cold night, scratching, wanting to get in, and the door is not going to open. So we want to ask, we want to knock, we want to seek, and we want to enter. What we really need is Christ and eternal life, even more than our daily necessities, because without God giving us daily life, by creating us with a body and soul, without breathing us into us life, without giving us purpose to know, love, serve, worship, and enjoy Him, even gathering food and, and clothing and shelter is meaningless, isn't it? That's why Solomon said after denying himself, no pleasure and no end of anything as far as what his eyes want. He said the conclusion of this, fear God and keep his commandments. And he says this applies to every person. So many that have taken these words, ask, knock, seek, and enter, they've taken it to mean, that, hey, God's your daily genie. Just ask him for whatever you want. You can, as the, as the uh, televangelists say, you can speak with words. These words are, are little vessels, containers, and you can basically force God and through the angels to give you whatever you want. Is that true? No, it's a lie. The prosperity false teachers, they assert that God can make you healthy, wealthy and wise, and make you have your best life now. But I believe it's talking about having your best life later. That's what this sermon's about and what we're to be asking for. It's talking about especially entering the kingdom of God, and the entire sermon is not about how you can get more stuff, it's how you can be saved. That is what this book is about. It's not being, it's, it includes some moral things, but it's not about being more moral, it's not about how getting more stuff, it's not how to enjoy your life better, a self-help. No, you can go and gorge yourself in all those kind of self-help books at the Barnes & Noble up the street. Plenty of that there to go around. It tells you about your greatest need. It's a gospel sermon telling you about your greatest need, that you can be saved from the fair and just wrath of God against your sins, and instead of gaining not only forgiveness, but entrance into a future and everlasting kingdom. My friends, that is good news, isn't it? You know, it's amazing. You'll sit down at a time. How many of you have ever gone through those painful timeshare presentations? Anybody ever do that? All right, you get the free thing, but you have to sit there for four hours and say no like 15 times. And then guys will go, let me give you it. And then they get the, you, give you the big boss, and then he comes and you get the big boss. And you finally work your way up there where there's no other big boss to say no to. And you say, hey, no, thank you. I'm really not interested, but I, I do appreciate the free here at the hotel. That's hard to say, isn't it? <laughs> but some of us would want that time share. I would say there's a great, the greatest time share, the greatest 401k, the greatest retirement plan, and hardly anybody's investing in pursuing that. And that is the kingdom. And so our greatest need being saved from God's wrath, this future kingdom. And he says, you must ask, if you want to enter the kingdom, here's the answer from Jesus. You must ask for it by faith. You can't earn it. It's not a works-based religion. What I call uh, the try harder religion or try hard enough, man, God's going to let me squeak by. No, if you want to get in the kingdom, you have to be washed clean of your sin. 
Your heart has to be renewed and, and made brand new with a new spirit to go with the, and be indwelt in by the Holy Spirit where your new spirit goes with that new Holy Spirit and you are a new creation in Christ. You must be transformed like that in order to get in that kingdom. And it says this, can flesh and blood enter that kingdom? And the answer is no. So you can't enter this kingdom unless you ask and you have asked for the Lord to do these things, to forgive you and make you, to regenerate you, to make you brand new. And notice this, if Jesus was raised from the dead from the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit lives in you, that same Spirit lives in you, what does that mean for you and I? We too shall be raised, Romans 8, 11. So can any of you raise yourself from the dead? Anybody have in common? Uh, you know, the one baseball player put himself on ice. You know, he froze himself. I can't remember what his name, some famous baseball player. They froze in his body. But I'll be honest, would you really want to come back as like an 85-year-old guy? <laughs> I don't. You know, I want the new body where I can run with new knees again. And, you know, just yesterday, just a few laps around my house playing with my kids. I was like, oh, you know, getting sore. So we see that we're, we're going to have this time to, to be raised from the dead. We can't even hardly travel to the nearest planet, much less raise ourselves from the dead or enter the heaven. How many of you know where heaven's at? Anybody know where you're even going? Okay, we know it's up. It's around somewhere. <laughs> okay. We know that the first heaven, Paul said, is our, is, a, is our atmosphere. The second heaven is outer space. But the third heaven is the abode of God. And how can you get there if you and I don't even know where it is? You don't even have the address. If you don't know how to get somewhere, what do you need to do? If you, Spencer, if you're going to go somewhere, what do you, you say, hey, can I have the address? We have to ask for it. And so going back to how we ask, knock, seek, and enter, I want to say to you this. We then pray. We ask God for all these things that we can't do on our own. We don't ask Jesus, Lord, give me what I want. I would say, Lord, help. I would ask you, give me the kingdom and give me just enough in this life so I'm pleasing to you to where I can come safely into your kingdom. That's what this is about. But if you ask with wrong motives, oh, you want to come to Jesus so he'll make your life perfect here in this life? Be careful if you're truly saved with that kind of motive. You are not made or he is not made for you, you are made for him. Is that a true statement? And a lot of people think, oh, God, you know, Jesus is here for me, to make me, you know, like I'm the king and he's, he's, he's here to serve me. No, we are the slaves and we're here to serve him. And so some of you may be asking with wrong motives as Christians with your prayer life, and I want to say to you today, do you treat grace cheaply? Are you grieving the Holy Spirit? not recognizing that we were made for him and that we're here for him and not the other way around. Romans 9.21 says this, Does not the potter have the right over the clay? And in 9.20 says, Who are you, O man, to talk back to God? The thing molded will not say to the molder, Why did you make me this, will it? That's why we sing all those songs last week. It's all about you, Jesus, and all this is for you, for your glory and your fame. It's not about me as if you should do things my way, you alone are God, and I surrender to your way. Is that true? Did you mean those words last night? That's what we are looking at here this morning. So let's, uh, if we looked at our text, we see here, it says, Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. <laughs> For everyone who asks, receives, and he who seeks, finds. And him who knocks, it will be opened. Now that's all the part I'm going to cover for the rest of the sermon. Well, let's break that down and say, do you, do you really know, do you really know what that's talking about here? Do you really understand those verses? Let's look at the overall main idea. So it talks about asking and seeking and knocking. Yes, we can ask for our things like food and clothing, physical necessities, but we also see we're to be seeking. One of the things we're going to look here, every time the word seek is used in the Bible, it's in the context of relationship. You shouldn't be seeking a new job or, or seeking you know, to, to be rich or seeking a new house. This word seeking, when it says seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, this is about seeking a person. This word is exclusive. And it's interesting in this, when we get to that, we'll see that the word seeking, there's only two ways people are seeking. Either people are seeking to worship Jesus and be with Jesus or they're seeking to kill Jesus. One, it's one of two choices in how you seek him. And obviously one's a really good relationship and one's a really bad one. Then we'll also look 
So we want to be seeking God in a relationship, His protection, His wisdom, His will, His way, His glory, His praise and honor. And I would just say, is that what you're seeking in life, those things? Or are you seeking things of yourself in that category? That is important. Are you asking for the wrong things? Or are you seeking the wrong things? And then knocking, are you knocking at the wrong doors? Are you knocking and saying, hey, you know, it's, it's very rare someone just says, hey, Chad, I just want to serve more at TBC. Knocks on my door and says, hey, put me more to work. I really want to just do more for people. I want to really do less for myself. No, usually we get people who leave and say, well, no one talked to me. No one served me. Nobody pampered me enough. Nobody met my felt needs. Are we knocking and seeking the wrong kind of approval? But we know that this door is the kingdom to get in the body of Christ, the church. If you ask God, the first thing he'll do is he'll give you a body, a church to belong to, to be part of the ecclesia, the assembly of the colon. Second thing is he'll give you a kingdom, the millennial kingdom, in which then you will reign with Christ for a thousand years. And this, this knock also has a third part to get in the eternal state, which, which Dennis has covered beautifully in Revelation 21 and 22. That's what we're going to cover today. So let's go to the next slide here. Ask. What does it mean to, to ask and it will be given to you? This word for ask means to make a request or even to make a demand. As if making a request in prayer of God. There's three points that when we see what it means to ask in Scripture. The Scripture tells us, if we looked at all the kind of uh, words about ask, that's why I looked them up. There's three points that I came up in my study. The first thing the Bible tells us to do is we, we can ask God about anything. So that includes food, clothing, and shelter if we need it. We're also to ask God humbly in how we present that to God. And we're especially then, as this verse is talking, kind of to ask for salvation. And that really is tied to his name. Because why does it say ask anything in his name? Well, because his name, Jesus, is a reference to salvation. Jesus is literally mean Yahweh saves or Yahweh is salvation. So if you ask anything in his name, you're saying, Lord, I'm asking for something that pertains to salvation. So let me tell you this. When you ask God in prayer for all things that don't pertain to salvation, it's not a guarantee you're going to get it. But when you ask for things that pertain to salvation, to the, to the will and the glory of Jesus, it says that he will answer it. And this is important. So one of the things we see, can we approach God about anything? Let's look at that first point. Let me just give you a few verses. Matthew 18, 19. Again, I say to you that if, any of you, uh, if two of you agree on anything um, about anything that they may ask, it shall be done to them by my Father who is in heaven. John 14, 14. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. John 16, 23. Truly I say to you, if you ask the Father for anything in my name, he, he will give it to you. Can you go to your Father about anything? And I would say to you, how many times are we going through a great trial and we've never even asked God about it once. You're making a big decision. You've never even asked God for his wisdom about it once. You can ask God about anything. And I would say to us, TBC, pour out your heart to God this year in prayer. You can talk to him about anything. And you can, you can tell him, say, Lord, I'm honestly struggling so much with that sin. I don't want to love it, but I do. And so God, help me. Or Lord, I'm really frustrated with that person over there. Help me to love them unconditionally. Help me, God, to do what I can't do myself. This is supernatural. Is it not supernatural to love someone unconditionally? When they're sinning against you and you not to sin back at them, you can't do that without any other way except for supernatural power. Ask him to do that for you. If you haven't been able to do it, maybe you haven't asked. You can ask him about anything. Then it says, ask him humbly. Be careful that you ask according to his will, with pure motives, not for your own pleasures, but for God's will and glory to be accomplished in your life. 1 John 5 talks about this. And it says that if, it says that we have the confidence before him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. But it has to be according to his will. It has to be with right motives, James 1 says. And it says you, do not, you have not because you ask not, but it also says, but when you ask, you do not receive it because you ask with wrong motives, James 4, 2 through 3. And, that you, and you don't doubt. So you have to ask confidently, you have to ask hum humbly in how you do it, so you can be about anything, but do it with faith, do it with humility. And then lastly, as we're going to get in here, let's look at the, the context. How do I know that this asking is about salvation? <laughs> 
Well, the whole context of the Lord's Prayer, look at the context. Yes, you, it is a part there that you can ask Him for daily bread. But what is the bigger part of that prayer in the context of the Sermon on the Mount? Thy kingdom what? Come, and thy will be done on earth as is in heaven. That, to me, sounds like a kingdom, doesn't it? Doesn't sound like your, your new housing plans or your new business plans. Doesn't sound like anything like that. That sounds like his kingdom and his building plan is what should be on our minds. Look at the context, then, in the section about not worrying about your life. So don't worry about your life. Think about this. If Jesus rose from the dead, and if Jesus gave you salvation, and if Jesus promises you a kingdom, doesn't your food, clothing, and shelter seem kind of minor? Yes, that's included in what you can ask for. But he's saying ask for the big thing, and then don't worry about these little things, because if you got the big thing, the little things are included. All right, so no batteries not included. Or yeah, no, food, clothing, shelter is not included. You got to get that separate. Oh, Jesus isn't going to do that to you. So, he's, so that's in Matthew chapter 6. Not worrying about your life, what you'll eat or wear or drink. Are you, is your life not more than food and your body more than clothing? And says, you have little faith. God's going to clothe you and take care of you because you're more valuable than the flowers and all that just fades. Next, look at the context here. This is the kicker. This is the proof. The overall context of the Sermon on the Mount, especially the rest of Matthew 7, the conclusion of the sermon, is about the kingdom of God and making sure you enter it. Are you sure you have your reservation? You have your ticket? Matthew 6 says this, but seek first, or seek protos, means in Greek, first above all things, above everything else, the what? The kingdom of God. And how to get into it. How do you get into it? His righteousness is how you enter. That, if you seek that, my friends, what does he say? All these other things, food, clothing, shelter, physical worries, things in this life, will be what? Added to you. Look at Matthew 7, though, and this is in our passage. We won't get to it today. We'll get to it next week. Matthew 7, 13 through 14. We know it's about the kingdom and what we're asking and seeking and knocking about because it says this. Enter through the narrow gate. This isn't the gate to Jermaine's yard. It says, for the gate is wide and the, and the way is broad that leads to what? To destruction, death. And there are many who enter through it. Most of the world's on that path and going this place. But you, it says, the way, but the narrow way is, a, is a, 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 a small is the way and the gate is narrow that leads to life and there are only a few who find it. That's how I know. Context, context, context. So we certainly can call and ask God for daily provisions. But, but, but doesn't trusting God daily for our physical needs going hand in hand with trusting Him for salvation, which comes first? Salvation first and everything else will be added to you in, as well. You can trust Him. If you can trust Him to save your soul from death and raise you from the dead, can't you also then trust Him with your daily needs of this life? You can. Think about it. Because if you believe in Jesus as God and you're trusting His righteousness to enter the kingdom and you've asked Him to be Lord of your life, by default, that does, doesn't that mean that you're a child of God and that He's going to take care of you? The answer is yes. So have absolute faith and confidence He's going to provide what you need because if He provided and secured salvation with His own life by rising from the dead, doesn't that also demand that we can trust His power and goodness about all things, including the provisions for our legitimate needs that we encounter in the future. Ask, then, truly means asking him for salvation. So while this phrase in Matthew 7 about asking certainly includes asking about anything, including food and clothing, the believer is, first of all, and foremost, to make sure that they've asked for the kingdom first. You don't get the food first. No, you get the kingdom first, and then the promises of the provision. And so what are we to ask for, seek, or knock? The kingdom of God. How do I know this? We are not to be asking primarily for those things, but this is the kicker. Look at Luke 11. This is how I know. The parallel passage to this, where it mentions this exact phrase, ask, seek, knock, enter. Notice, if you read through all of Luke 11, we don't have time, but here's what he, he ends he's, at the end. He says, the overall... Um, he says, or, he says, if you ask him an egg, will you give him a scorpion? If you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, <laughs> how much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Luke adds that key phrase. Will he not give what? The Holy Spirit to those who ask him. That's how I know, and it took me a while, because I, I thought it was about food, clothing, and shelter, and I had to rewrite the whole sermon, because I got to Luke 11, like, I got it wrong. It's, I thought asking was about the food, and the seeking was about the kingdom, 
No, the asking is about the kingdom, the seeking is about the kingdom, and the knocking is about the kingdom because Luke tells me, when you ask, he will give you not food, not clothing, not shelter, but what? The Holy Spirit. It's salvation. And that's what all that really matters here. He, if you ask God, will he not fail? Or will he fail to give you the Holy Spirit? And the answer is no, he won't. That's why John 11, he says to Martha, <coughs> and he says, he says uh, she, she was questioned, hey, Lord, can't you raise my brother from the dead? What did he challenge her on first? Do you believe on the resurrection and the life? Okay, let's worry about Lazarus later, but what do you believe about me and the kingdom? And so let me read the dialogue, showing what comes first, or what we were to ask, not, seek, and, and not. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. What would she focus on? The temporary, her kingdom. Even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know he will rise again in the, <coughs> at the resurrection in the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And I want to ask you guys, do you believe that? And she said, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who has come into the world. That's why John 14 says he's the way, the truth, and the life. That's the most important thing. He says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. He will take care of our needs. He'll take us to a kingdom where even if you have ills momentarily in this life, you won't later. 1 John 5. And so here's the, the roll-up of all of this about what you're asked for. It's the kingdom. Ask for the kingdom. Ask to be saved. Why 1 John 5? Here's the testimony, the overall big deal picture. If God has given us eternal life and this life is in his Son, he who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. What should you ask for? Life eternal life. Ask for the kingdom of God. And it says, these things I've written to you that you may know that you have eternal life. Do you know it? Are you absolutely sure? And then it says, this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. That's after you have the life. That's after you have the eternal life. Then all your prayers will be answered, not before. And it says, and if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request which we have asked from him. That's good, isn't it? So question, have you ever asked Jesus to be your personal Lord? What's this passage? What's it commanding? What's the promise? John 3, 16. Here's the promise. That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send the Son of the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who is believing in him is not judged, but he who is not believing has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the begotten Son of God. You see here that the asking, the believing, the whosoever is all about the kingdom. It's all about this. But it says everyone, notice this, this is the judgment. Lights come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are real. They just wanted the free handout. They just wanted to make, have Jesus make their lives better. They weren't wanting to come into the, into the light. And that's how do we know this? It says this. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested and have been wrought in God. There's a promise here. Jesus will save you. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. A great promise here. A great promise. So... What, what do you ask for? You're, you, you should ask Jesus to be your Lord. Ask him for eternal life. Ask him for the kingdom. Have all of you asked that of Jesus? That's what becoming a Christian is. When you say, I repent, Jesus is Lord, that's what you're doing. Romans 10, 9. What does it mean to seek and you will find? The second point. What does it mean to seek and you, will, and you shall find? Well, it, uh, I was an associate pastor at Seek and You Shall Find Bible Church. So it's not Sasif or we joked, uh, we, we love the people and the, the, doc, the doctrine, but not the, the name. Like, they always, people would ask me, say what? Say if I'm like, you haven't heard of that word? Well, oh, it's an acronym. Seek and ye shall find. Okay, got it. All right, got it. But we see, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things we add to you as well. All right, so a real quick thing. I got I, I to gotta take this, and I was, um, you know, let's do this. Let's pause there. I'm going to pick this up next week. And we're going to do seek, and we're going to do find, and we're going to do uh, the knocking in the kingdom next week. All right, let, let me just give you one closing thought of application here. So I want to ask you, which of these circles best depicts your life? 
look at this one. This is basically, it says there's someone on the narrow road that leads to life, and there's someone on the wide, wide, wide road of destruction. Here's another way to depict it. The unbeliever, who's on the throne of their life? Who's the God of their life? Who, who's on the throne? Self. Notice that Christ is outside their life, and all their interests are divided and resulting in discord and frustration. It says the unbeliever has misery and destruction marked their ways. They have no peace. There's no fear before their eyes. And it says they have a continual lust for more. Does that describe you as the self-directed life? Second circle is the Christian on the narrow path. Christ is on the throne of their life. Now, my life isn't quite like this. My, you know, all my interests are not perfectly ordered yet. But I'm working on it, right? That might take me till the kingdom. But self then is subservient to Christ. And Christ is ordering my life slowly but surely. Amen? I want to ask you, which of these circles best depicts your life? Are you on the narrow road or the wide road? And I, I use this in the investigative Bible study. I said there's, there's two kinds of people, the righteous and the unrighteous, traveling two different roads, the wide road and the narrow road, leading to totally two different destinations, heaven or hell. Marissa's brother is an engineer, and he... he uh, does engineering for railroad companies as far as trusses and, and bridges out in the middle of nowhere. And one late night he was in Texas and he was exhausted and he was in his rental car and he was traveling down a dirt road trying to get home. He didn't realize that his GPS is, was off and he was on a road that actually dead ends into a lake. And so he just went right off into the road and just plunged that rental car right in the middle of that lake. And fortunately, he had bought the right insurance where he just called him and said, I'm sorry, you know, but pick up your car, give me a new one, and, and he went on with his life. But I want to I let you know something. You may think that it's all party, fun and party, being on the wide road leading that one direction, but, I want, but do you know where that road leads? Do you know where it ends up? Do you know where it dumps off? The Bible says that that road leads at a lake as well. It's called the lake of fire. And that's why it says, wide is the road that leads to where? Destruction. And it says, many, many are on that path. But narrow is the way that leads to life, and only a few find it. And I would say, would you be so wise enough today to realize you are on that wide road, and you don't want to go to hell, and so the answer to the sermon today is you have to ask God. Ask him for directions. Lord, how do I get on the narrow road? How do I get off this path that leads to destruction? I don't want to just dump my car off into the end of just oblivion and live my life from something that's meaningless. I want my life to count. Would you pray with me as we ask God to do that? Father, I pray that in this new year, as we study your word, Father, that if there's anyone here who has not asked you for the Holy Spirit, they have not asked you to be Lord of their life. They have not asked you, Lord, for eternal life. And they have not asked to enter the kingdom. Father, would you, Lord, be so kind and gracious to them to just confirm in their own heart, through your Holy Spirit, you convict them of sin, of righteousness, and judgment. And you would, in those three things, you would convince them, Lord, that they are a sinner. Their current path leads to the lake of fire, and that is their destination unless they do something and ask you for directions. And Father, I pray that you convince them of your righteousness, that their righteousness will not be accepted. It is not good enough, and Lord, they need, then your right, they need to be clothed in your righteousness to be made holy and pure in order to know a perfect God and to enter a perfect heaven, and that they would ask you for your righteousness. And Lord, then that you would also convince them of judgment, Conv convince them through the, the, the GPS, the map of Scripture, that that road does lead to hell, and they need to turn around, they need to repent. They need to get off that wide destruction. And that they would then will call you and ask you to be Lord of their life. Father, if there's anybody here who and you are just prompting to come to salvation, Lord, I pray that you would just give them the courage, even right now, Lord, just to stand and say, I repent, Jesus is Lord. Would anybody here just want to make sure uh, you've never made the good confession, you never asked publicly and said, I repent, Jesus is Lord, you've never publicly confessed Christ before men, You've never asked him for life or salvation or forgiveness or righteousness or just any of that. And, so, and, and you want to. You just want to ask Jesus publicly. Whether there anybody who would just have courage who wants to be saved today and just ask Jesus publicly for, for him to save you? Would anybody want to have that courage to stand up and just say, I repent, Jesus is Lord, as a way to express that?
Father, I pray that you would take us from this place rejoicing for those of us who have asked you, knowing that you have given us eternal life. We already have it. It's an abundant life. It's a great life. Lord, I pray that we would enjoy you more in 2014. I pray that you would help us <laughs> to keep the main thing the main things. Help everyone here to really resolve themselves in the month of February. Lord, to have 28 days of just straight power in their life. To get your perspective. To get your peace. And Lord, change this church to be according to your will. To where, Lord, we reflect the goodness of the kingdom in our marriages, in our parenting in our integrity, in our speech. Do your work in us, God. And as we look at uh, what it means to seek and to knock next week, Lord, may you help me to communicate that clearly in Jesus' name. Amen.